graph and it tells you what frequencies of the elements that are inside of whatever that is and it tells you, oh, that's cotton or that's gasoline or whatever by the frequency and frequency really is cycles per second. If you go to the store 10 times a week, the frequency in which you go to the store is 10, 10 times a week. So we use frequency in that realm, but we also use frequency for um, identification of plastic and pencils and wood and paper and humans and the frequencies of your voice. Just like in a song, there is notes in your voice, there are frequencies that can be divided up into notes. And you look at those frequencies and you can tell what's wrong and what's right about a person. Is it the same as a wavelength? Well, a wavelength, yes, it's related to it. But a wavelength can be different. You can have sine wave, you can have square wave. So uh, we use sine waves in what we're doing. And that's one of the things that my voice creates is sine waves. And that's impossible by human parameters. Machines can do it. But my voice creates pure tones. And I think it's because I had a near-death experience when I was very young. I nearly drowned. And there's a, a device, not a device, an apparatus, something that's in my ear that's supposed to be dormant that dolphins have. Sonar capability? or It's called a sacculus. Hmm. And it, underwater, I guess, it tells you which way is up or down. Um, and I nearly drowned because I couldn't tell which way was up or down. So that's been uh, activated in my ear. And, you know, I used to say, everybody has a sound coming out of their ear. I worked in a speech and hearing department, and my supervisor, Dr. Fusey, said, oh, Sherry, everybody thinks you're weird already. Please don't say that out loud. <coughs> Excuse me, but it wasn't until a couple of years later that John Hopkins University vindicated me. There really is a sound coming out of the ear. It's above normal hearing. It's called an otoacoustic emission. And it's all over PubMed now. It's being used for diagnostics of liver, kidney, and gallbladder disease. It's incredible what you can tell from that sound. And they've didn't done cross-linking studies. What we're looking at in the voice with the frequencies is the frequencies coming out of the ear, only, you know, we don't have to put people's head in a vice and stick a, a wire in their ear and that kind of thing. And we can do it over the phone. Um, so we're looking at the frequencies in people's voice as a representation of what's going on in their brain. So it's a vocal footprint, so to speak, or signature, correct? Perfect. Call it a signature sound. A vocal footprint. I love it. Yeah. I'm good with these things. Well, That's well, why I have the, the, the rain-making company. That's my company. So I help create context and, and uh, descriptions and packaging and marketing and communication for solutions and it. discoveries. Yeah, so that's what it reminds me of is um, it's a signature, so to speak. But what's fascinating is that this seems like a very affordable form of advanced 21st century diagnostics. I just did a piece on that with Art Robinson, Dr. Art Robinson, who's in the Portland area, who's spending a lot of money on miniaturizing and quickening the speed to which we get to advanced diagnostics and affordable diagnostics. And it sounds like you have one of the 21st century revolutions in diagnostics right at your fingertips, right at the voice. It certainly looks like it. We had a guy in doctor referral about a month ago and they said he has Lou Gehrig's disease, and they told him, go home and die. So he came to us in desperation. We did his voice, and I said, I don't think you have Lou Gehrig's disease. I think you have Lyme's disease. So he went back to his doctor, and his doctor said, those people are nuts. They don't know anything. You know, don't listen to them. So we sent him to a specialist. The man had Lyme's disease. His doctor was willing to provide him a death sentence and no hope because he didn't want to be wrong. Now they're giving him the medication for Lyme disease and he's coming out of it. He doesn't have to die in the next month or so. This is really re reminds me very much of the early time of dousing 
I did a show with Bill Cox back in 2004, who was then 85 years old and was one of the people that used dowsing to access primary water in what was then dried up Lake Elsinore. And he was sharing with me both in television that we did and in radio at the time that the engineers had such difficulty and resistance to the new methodology of digging and getting below the aquifer to access the water, which is where the primary water was, because they had never done that before. They didn't want to drill for it except the way they're normally drilling. So they would just want to go right to the aquifer. And they didn't want to use an advanced and different method, an ancient method for locating where the water is. So it reminds me here, you are able to diagnose or you're able to figure out that it's Lyme disease. And at the same time, because the method you're using is not standard and it's affordable and it's quick, it's not being received for the marvel that it is. Well, it lacks scientific foundational principles of how it's happening. But let me give you a story to explain that. It wasn't until recently, maybe the last three years, that there was a scientific explanation of why aspirin worked, but it was still out there on the market. Absolutely. So they finally figured out, you know, what are the receptors, the pain receptors that it's hitting. But we, there are several things beyond that that we can do. We had a doctor in here, and we had helped him before, but he had been in a car accident. He was an emergency room doctor, and it had um, paralyzed his little finger. And we did it, uh, his voice print, it showed up which finger, we put the sounds on, and in 20 minutes he had full use of that finger again. Now that, all that's on YouTube, but what isn't on YouTube that we found out is the computer came up and it said, blink, 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 in red, you need to pay attention to this. And it was troponin, which is a protein that says there's been heart damage to the muscle. Oh my God. And I, and I said... You know, what happened beside your finger? What was really going on? He said, well, the airbag blasted in, in my face. I said, was your wife with you? Yeah, the airbag blasted in her face. I said, I need her print, too. In both of them was this really high troponin that the emergency squad, the hospital, they all had missed. And we were able to say, you need to go have this taken care of because your heart muscle has been damaged. This is a whole other side of your diagnostic ability, which is the health and wellness side, correct? Yes, and we also do predictive. We're going to have to wait a minute before we get to that because I did a show on remote viewing. So predictive with regard to the voice. Now, well, let me ask you this. Let's just go back to one thing, if I may, here. It was Royal Rife that came before us. Was he not one of the first people that we are aware of that was pointing at the whole domain of frequencies? It goes back to Pythagoras and the harmonic series and that he heard sounds from everything. So it is way old. Right. This is ancient. I often say it's frequency or new medicine or an ancient mystery revealed. That's interesting. Very, very interesting. You won an award for the New Scientist of the Year at the International Association of New Science in 2001. It was such an incredible honor. But and apparently a humanitarian award along with John Nash, the yes. subject of the uh -huh. film A Beautiful Mind, former First Lady Betty Ford, and several other distinguished MDs and PhDs. Where did this come from? Some of the research that we have done, but they made me make a speech and it was funny, I said, I thought I was going to have to die <laughs> to get any kind of reward. And so I was really happy it was happening when, um, uh, when I was alive. But one of the most proud things that I, uh, and I don't usually say things like this, but I w I'm so proud that I taught in a medical school. I taught doctors for two years on how to do this technique. Where? Uh, in, it was the Columbia University in Washington before they got closed down because they didn't have a library. Are you serious? Serious. Uh, Georgetown University agreed to provide their library to the students, but the State Accreditation Board wouldn't uh, allow it to happen. And they were uh, creating, teaching alternative medicine methods. And they had classes go through every quarter that flew in from all over the world to learn these very innovative 
techniques, and we were one of the techniques that they were sharing.